if we if we lose all of your all your recording and you're unable to re-record new answers to the old questions like a week later, mm-hmm. we have to cast someone to play you and <laughs> make up answers to these questions in badly reconstructing this episode. Uh-huh. What kind of voice do you want this actor who's going to portray you uh, to have? Kind of like Kermit the Frog, I think. <laughs> oh, he can he can, uh, he can talk up here. Yeah, <laughs> that's my natural voice, I think. Hey ho, I'm Casey Maloney, and welcome <laughs> to Talking Joe. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Live from the Talking Joe Studios. It's Talking Joe. Talking Joe is on the air. Hey, 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 you, the Rocksteady crew. It's me, Mark, and welcome to Talking Joe, the G.I. Joe Comics podcast. If you are new to the show, you can find out all of the details over at the website, which is talkingjoe.co.uk. Today, we will be looking at G.I. Joe, a real American hero, issue 289, which came out just this very week at time of recording. Coming out, yes, 23rd of February, 2022. Uh, And this issue is a spotlight on Dawn and Helix. Uh, Joining me, as always, it's a real American Tim. It's Tim Finn. Hello, Mark, and hello, listeners. Excellent to have you uh, with us once again, but let's not chit-chat because we've got another person waiting in the wings. Joining us today is a very special guest. It is the artist of the issue, Casey Maloney. Now, here is the intro. Casey Maloney is an artist living in Ventura, California with his daughter and cat, Uh. He creates creator-owned comics called Bird Brains, and outside of that also creates art in all mediums, paint, pencil, pen and ink, digital, uh, covering landscapes, portraits, and abstract. But in the world of comics, his credits are mostly IDW. They include Star Trek, The Next Generation, The Space Between, Star Trek Infestation, uh, and a few uh, comics with Tom Waltz, Zipper, uh, from 2008, uh, The Last Fall, 2014, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Annual from 2021, and over in the world of G.I. Joe, the uh, G.I. Joe Rise of Cobra movie adaptation from 2009, Snake Eyes Cobra Civil War uh, 6 to 8 from uh, 2011, which introduced uh, Quinn to the IDW universe, and the cover for G.I. Joe issue 281, depicting Snake Eyes and Scarlet Date Night at the shooting range. So, yeah, a good pedigree there in G.I. Joe, uh, even if uh, not covering the main Larry Hammer written book so far. So, welcome to the show, Casey. Thank you very much. You guys do all your research, don't you? That's good information. I do like to do a nice little bit of homework. Uh, was was there any career highlights there to date that, that I missed out in my research? No, that's a bit. I'm pretty sporadic, honestly, in the comic book industry, but I love it. (laughs) Excellent. You sort of dip in in, into the world of comics uh, alongside other other work. Yeah, lots of art, just art in general. Uh, Art in general, Mm -hmm. and and some of that in the Venn diagram is comics. Mm -hmm. The the other art that you're making is this uh, illustration freelance for, for clients? Is this gallery work where besides maybe the internet where might someone see your work if it's not comics um i have a website caseymaloneyart.com not to do a plug right now but uh uh lots uh commissions for friends i do just make paintings for myself and then sometimes they will sell by themselves too but yeah it's just pretty much for me mostly and sometimes it helps me out in life but yeah lots of commissions too Uh i'm working on a couple right now like painting commissions which is fun i haven't painted in a while very good. So uh, typically at this point, we'll, we'll ask for your origin story. So in terms of your your history with Joe, the G.I. Joe comics, the G.I. Joe toys in your youth, um, you know, was, was that something that, that featured? And alongside that, you know, your art development, what was it in both G.I. Joe and art that led you to the point today where you're, you've, you've been drawing uh, G.I. Joe issue uh, two? Eight nine. So, uh, so where where did it begin for you, both in in GI Joe and uh, and art? Um, I was born in the eighties, so it was definitely around me and influenced me. And I had some toys and stuff, and I watched the comic. I'm not too diehard about it, but it was definitely part of my upbringing. 
Uh, I didn't read much of the comics or anything. I've been making comics my whole life, basically. Like, I do a lot mm-hmm. of art, but comics are kind of where I'm at, I would say, my main focus. Um, just storytelling mm-hmm. in general. But I would say definitely the comic and just, like, the 80s in general, like Transformers, G.I. Joe, all that definitely influenced my taste and style, you know? Like, you can't help it. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm definitely happy to be drawing G.I. Joe. It's super fun. I would like to draw Transformers, too. <laughs> Was there, was there a particular uh, book or uh, publisher that you were drawn to um, in the comics world when, when you were sort of picking them up uh, in those uh, formative years? I'm definitely a Marvel guy, to be honest. <laughs> I do like DC, but uh, I was brought up on Marvel and X-Men and stuff like that. And Jim Lee is a huge uh-huh. influence, yeah. or used to be. I try to not have style influences right now, just just drawing what happens. But all that, like, image, all that, the, <laughs> I don't know how you guys feel about image and stuff, but it was fun when you were, you know, a little <laughs> teenager reading comics. Yeah, I mean, I think we're, we're probably not too, too far away in terms of ages, and, and that, but mm. that, that sort of image launch when they initially sort of broke off. Yeah, the 90s. Mostly from, from their, their Marvel books that they were doing at the time, those hot artists. Yeah. It was, yeah, a very exciting time for comics. I and, mean, they're and, silly and stuff, but uh, they're think, really fun. <laughs> I think you couldn't help be be swayed at the at the, that point mm-hmm. to to you know be excited by by kind of the the images a new publisher and what they uh, what they were doing. <laughs> yeah, but I definitely like Marvel. Still, Marvel's definitely I like a lot. IDW, of course, I like. <laughs> so you you mentioned a little uh, a moment ago that though you are a kid of the '80s mm-hmm. and read some comics, it sounds like. Mm-hmm. You did you say weren't watching the G.I. Joe cartoon or weren't reading the comic? I didn't read the comics. I saw some of the cartoons and stuff, you know, just like on Saturday mornings. And I had some of the toys and stuff and but I didn't get too far into it. Like that and Mask and Transformers and stuff like that I was into and Star Wars toys and all that stuff. Yeah, so big big melting pot of all of those eighties properties. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a melting pot for sure. A stew. Did you go to art school? Did you no, uh, self taught pretty much. I mean, I went to like community college and had some art teachers there and, and art teachers in high school, but, and I credit them a lot. They're, everyone's been an influence in my life, art teacher or not. But uh, yeah, not formally trained or anything. I read a lot of books and stuff and just draw all day. <laughs> so that's all you can really do, I think. Uh, it'd be cool to go to college for all that stuff. And like right now, I'm learning a lot of 3D programs and just based off YouTube and it's working and stuff, but it'd be cool to have an education, honestly. Go to school, kids. I'll say that. <laughs> That's a good segue. I um I spotted um I spotted uh, what looked to be a three D model of a uh, Arashikage, possibly Snake Eyes sword. Oh yeah, that was fun on uh, your art station site. Is is that something that you created just for fun? Yeah, I just did it for fun. Uh, just I have these old ideas, and I want to see if I can make them in three D, and uh, I just learn as I go. But that was really cool. I just wanted to make a cool sword and stuff. I was actually working on like a kind of like a 3D model of Helix just to like work just for fun while I was waiting uh, for right. a script. And uh, yeah, I was just working on like her costume and stuff and just seeing how to model it in 3D. Did the, the whole body thing didn't come out very well, but the sword came out really cool. So I focused on that. Was that 3D model of Helix something that you ended up using as a tool when you were actually drawing the book? Uh, it definitely helped me. It was actually Snake Eyes. I don't know if I said Helix, sorry, but it was Snake Eyes, uh, Don. But uh, oh, it, right. it did help with like the mask and stuff, like the visor and everything. Because that's kind of it's a tricky little thing, surprisingly. But I mean, you mm. can make it not tricky. But I like to make things somewhat realistic as much as I can. But uh, it that it yeah, helped yeah. me it helped it me cement her costume in my head. It's kind of like just sketching it, you know, over and over again, and get muscle memory. Mm. Just a little tool for myself. There's a. Um... It's it's not I don't know if it's a geodesic dome, but there's a there's a, a dome mm. in the issue. Yeah, definitely geodesic. Okay, so that is the word. Um, and it looks uh, so perfectly drawn that it looks a little bit like um, in one or two panels, like a three D model. <laughs> is that you guys are good? I did three D model that. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Good eye. So, when did you first decide t- that you wanted to get paid to draw comics that someone would publish, and what was that first job? My first job, I was probably, I don't know, maybe 20 or so. It was like, uh, I went to Comic-Con and I got a portfolio review with Committed Comics. I don't know if they're still around or not. They might not be. But, and they just gave me an 
gave me a good critique actually he had lots of pointers in my portfolio and storytelling tips and stuff and eric doherty was his name or tom doherty uh yeah then they gave me a job for like i think it was a three issue little thing gosh what was it called redemption or something ah i forget what it was called honestly <laughs> but it's committed comics it was like i don't know uh might have been like 2000 or something like that that was definitely my first job i don't know when i decided that i think i always wanted to be my career to be honest with you i never really had any doubt about that but that was my first job how did you how did you uh parlay that into b- bigger and better comics work or how did you get to idw uh that's all tom honestly like i'm not good at selling myself like i'm not a businessman or a salesman or anything like that so uh most of my stuff has been <laughs> generous of tom like there was a site i don't know if you guys know digital webbing forums and comics and stuff dot com it's like a little just a little comic site but they have a forum and they had like contests and i drew this picture of teenage mutant ninja turtles fighting daredevil and he hit me up and he's like oh this is really good i got some script for you and and we hooked up and then hooked up with i hero comics which is like a kind of like a digital comics kind of thing but they had comic uh published comics too and I think that morphed into Shooting Star Comics, or I don't know which one came before. <laughs> and yeah, he just we just kind of worked together on stuff like that. Little, lots of Tom's characters and stories, short stories and stuff. Some prose, like illustrating prose. And uh, eventually, we did Children of the Grave for uh, Shooting Star Comics, and that was like a four issue mini series, and that kind of cemented both of us, I think. And eventually. IDW reprinted that as a graphic novel and eventually Tom got a job writing and then he worked his way up to editor and stuff and so eventually uh you know <laughs> he hooks me up sometimes so I'm very grateful and that's <laughs> yeah that's pretty much the definitely the trajectory like the the paths of my career and his career are kind of strangely linked or they used to be at least mm-hmm. and and the, the, the work on, on G.I. Joe, is that something that you actively sought out or, or was it more a case of someone reaching out to you and saying, look, we've got uh, this coming up. Is, is it something that you might be interested in? Uh, Tom just hit me up and he asked if I would be interested. And I said, yes, <laughs> no hesitation, of course. G- going back, though, to the, the three issues of Snake Eyes mm-hmm. and the movie adaptation, because mm-hmm. that's that's now more than 10 years ago yeah. what about mm. those that was tom waltz as well yeah definitely tom waltz there too like i said i'm not i'm really bad at the business side of things so <laughs> i kind of wait for things that come to me in a way <laughs> it's not good <laughs> i guess the the movie adaptation is is kind of a, a fascinating thing just it I is guess, right? the genre it's interesting of 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 a movie adaptation in it in itself and as we're recording today there's been a, just been a news announcement that marvel are going to produce a comics ad- adaptation of the Mandalorian, oh, really? you know, one issue per per episode, and it it's, seems a, a kind of a slightly old old fashioned concept. I think the some of the appeal of that movie adaptation is back in the day mm. when you'd go to the cinema, mm. you didn't have VHS, and not even you know we didn't even have VHS, let alone a DVD or Blu-ray or a streaming. Yeah. And so then the comic was kind of the the only way that you could watch the you know read or re- relive the movie experience. If uh, you know bet- between that and the next time you are lucky enough to to find it on TV or on on when it eventually comes out on video or, or, or what, whatever, and you know Star Wars by um, Howard Chaykin, sort of the one of the ultimate examples yeah, that's great. of that. You know we've had some amazing examples of um, adaptations like um, John Bolton's work on um, Army of Darkness and some maybe less so amazing examples such as write that down. <laughs> the the T two the T two adaptation which. Um, I, I imagine it was done very quickly. Um, <laughs> I was just watching that last night, actually. <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd definitely recommend uh, the movie mm. of T2 over the comics adaptation. Good to know. So, so, so how did, uh, how, how did, what was the process of working on the Rise of Cobra adaptation like? What, what, what materials were you working from? Did you have the actual whole film or, or was it, um, you know, just series of photos or, or what uh, it was just photos yeah i didn't i didn't have script or well i had the comic script and i didn't have any film uh-huh. or anything they just sent a bunch of i think digital yeah i don't think i had any analog pictures but uh yeah it was just a bunch of digital files from the set like not even like straight from the film it's just like 
on the set pretty much stuff which is actually really oh, wow. interesting like i didn't see the movie while i was drawing the movie <laughs> so it was a really fun challenge actually i enjoyed it because i could kind of like not mm-hmm. really make it my own but i'm not tethered down to reference yeah it's not like you're you're just hitting pause and then just reproducing yeah. that bit of the actual film it's 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 i guess more more involved than, than that. yeah i made it more fun i would say I'm going to throw in a fact mm. here. So the, the comic adaptation was written by um, Denton Tipton, mm-hmm. who was an editor at the time at IDW. And he did have the screenplay to the movie. Oh, he did? Yeah, I figured. Like, it's pretty close. Uh, like, after, I did see the movie after it came out. I was like, oh, wow, I think I, we got it pretty right, <laughs> surprisingly. Um, I know I know that he had the screenplay because he showed it to me. At the yeah, time. that guy's professional. Man. That guy's great. <laughs> uh, uh, fun fact, actually. Um uh, he showed it to me, and for some reason, I turned to the final page, mm-hmm. and I spoiled. <laughs> I spoiled the end oh, of no. the movie long before the movie. This was a couple of months before the movie. <laughs> yeah, I spoiled the end of the movie by watching the end of the movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't look at the end of anything right? when I pick it up. I'm like, I'm, I'm scared of it. So, how does it compare drawing a Chuck Dixon GI Joe script or plot to a Larry Hama GI Joe plot? Uh, definitely just Larry Hama's way looser, you know, like it's way fun. I would say I'm not going to like play favorites, but I definitely like a loose script, like room, not to make it my own, but to have fun with it. And like, just like with the movie adaptation, like, uh, kind of, you know, use my creativity a little bit, which is what Larry Hama's, uh, loose plot format does. It's like the Marvel way, you know, of the, like kind of letting the artist do it and filling it in later after all the art's done it's old school kind of old school i would say hama's writing dialogue on top of your art after it's drawn which you draw from his plot. yeah it's really fun uh, is is that is that to say that chuck dixon's those three issues of snake eyes were you working from a full script i believe so i'd have to go back and look at it but um hmm. I, it, I definitely remember it being very well you know calculated and laid out and stuff and no holes or anything and definitely a very complete script right and when we've been talking to to joe artists um the there's sort of it has tended to be a sort of a common theme of, of there being a little bit of uh, a burning wick you know <laughs> leading up to an explosion of the the deadline oh, yeah. so uh yeah it'd be interesting to to know um you know, to what degree that sort of same time pressure applied applied to here? What was the what was the gap between you actually uh, finishing this book and and it hitting the stands? Uh, I hit the stands like a not too far after I finished it. I got if you want like a timeline. I think I started drawing in like mid November. I definitely took over a month uh, for sure, and then I finished like right after New Year's, and then it came out this Wednesday, February twenty third. Okay, okay. But yeah, I was I was definitely. There's some waiting around and stuff, and then they waited for me, of course. I'm definitely a slow artist. That's definitely something I want to work on, but I'm uncompromising is how I say. <laughs> when did you get the offer to draw the issue, and uh, were you given any choice as to which issue you might draw? Uh, no choice on the issue. It definitely said, I think it might have been vague at first, like, do you want to draw G.I. Joe? And then later on, it's like, here's, we're going to do 289. Um, and I have to go back to my emails to... See when I got the script, it was definitely a, a, wi- a ways, like maybe at least a month or two. I'm not sure. Were you trying to keep to a drawing schedule, like one page per day? I usually do about a page every two days. Sometimes I can do a page a day on like it depends on the page too. But and then there are the holidays and stuff and Christmas, which kind of slows me down every year. But um, yeah, I don't. I can't do a page a day sometimes, unfortunately. Hmm. And and what was what's your typical process for, for approaching a, a page? Um, you know what what materials do do you uh, use? Is it all analog, all digital, a mix mixture of both? Uh, definitely a mix. I use digital mostly for sketches and stuff, and like thumbnailing and layouts. All right, I guess I can walk you through. I usually do. I usually take the scripts and just draw little images that flash in my head as I'm working on it. And then I'll take those images and do like little thumbnails of the page layouts and stuff and see which direction all the action's going and which way the dialogue's going. 
and then I will uh, usually I'll s if I get like a good little thumbnail I'll scan that in and blow it up and then print it out a little bigger and then just tighten that up with pencils just draw over it then scan that in and then um, I'll blow that up to 11 by 17 the comic book size and then I'll just do final pencils on a, a comic book paper with a light box over the uh -huh. rough layout there is uh mark there's a totally awesome photo on casey's instagram uh a photo from two days ago uh which is 20 penciled uh, pages yes. of this issue all 20 penciled pages of my this issue laid out laid out <laughs> on uh, the, uh a bed or a floor or a couch yeah, that's my bed <laughs> into five by four pages okay um and 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 um this is this is not your this is not your first time collaborating with Maria Keen who inked this issue. No, the first one was that uh the TMT TMNT annual. Sorry, I have a hard time saying Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles all the time. Uh that was yeah, what did you say? Those last year? Yeah, twenty twenty one. But yeah, that was the first time I worked with her or met her and everything, but I definitely I like working with her a lot. I think we make a good team. Did Tom Waltz pair you two? Yes. Okay. You you had not been a any kind of collaborative team before this GI Joe issue, this Ninja Turtles issue. No, not me and her. Um, hmm. I think the only person that I've like somewhat worked with is like Jay Brown coloring uh, the two eight one cover, but everyone else I don't think I've worked with. I'm not sure about the letter. I'll have to check that. But no disrespect. I love letters. <laughs> Was there any uh, uh, s uh, scheduling possibility or desire on your part to not just pencil, but also ink this issue? Uh, I offered to ink at first, and then he said, oh, we're going to have a tight deadline, so I'll pair you up with Maria again, because she definitely speeds my, me up a bit. Hmm. But it would be fun to ink. I, would love, I love yeah. inking so much. I, I guess, you know, it means that you can work in I guess, parallel rather than sequential, mm -hmm. so that you've done a page and then she's inking it and you don't have to, it's not a matter of producing everything and then repeat. It's, it's working, uh, working yeah, at the same it's time. Got that assembly line. Yeah. Getting that nice Gantt chart flowing yeah. a bit quicker. She's, yeah. Uh, she's super <laughs> fast. Too. She's in, she's in England. So, uh, I would send it. Oh, is yeah. she? I didn't know so that. I would send it out and then she would like, you know, ink while I'm sleeping or we're all sleeping over here. And then in the morning it'd be ready. So it's crazy. She's really fast. Another pro. She is inking uh, from scans of your pencils. You still have your pencils. Yeah, she. I think she has been all digital so far on all my stuff so far. But she does do traditional inks, but not on the Ninja Turtles or this G.I. Joe comic. They're digital. I would send the scans, yeah, and she would send them back. Do you have a local comic book store where you could go and take a victory lap <laughs> this week? I was thinking about it, but I'm, I'm a shy guy. I'm very... Uh, hermit <laughs> but i do go to the comic shop i, I don't i they don't, don't mean, know who i am or anything, i don't mean I like <laughs> uh well if, if not if not take a loud public <laughs> obnoxious victory lap a quiet personal yeah. one did you go to your shop this week to see your comic on the no show? i was thinking about it. i was gonna take my kid and stuff because she likes to see that too but we'll probably go maybe tomorrow or something i'm going back to my store today and tomorrow maybe i'll maybe i'll take a picture of what it <laughs> please looks yeah like it's fun shop. seeing them out in the wild for sure it's a kick um, did you have a comic shop growing up? How? Because mm -hmm. it, it sounds like you were somewhat into comics in the in the eighties. What was your What was your comic uh, shop? It's still around. Well, it's kind of a different vibe now, but it was Ralph's Comic Corner in Ventura, California. And me and my brother would ride our bikes down there. It's like kind of like Midtown, and we would just spend all our money. I still have all my comics too. I think my parents have them at their house somewhere. But <laughs> but yeah, we'd uh, go down there all the time and spend our money and read comics and i actually now it's uh seth's comic corner and there's like a gaming center too it's actually expanded which is really nice it's a nice shop but i also go to arsenal comics in ventura which is yeah they're both really good i'm appreciative of the local businesses sounds like you have at least three places to tour on your <laughs> quiet personal modest uh, this is, victory lap it's growing today, and growing tomorrow the next day <laughs> uh yeah uh, i'll go in there and i'll take a look but I, i'm not gonna talk to anybody here <laughs> i if i like it comes back to that business thing if i was a good businessman i would say hey my comic coming out can i do a signing and stuff like that 
but yeah. <laughs> the the month that you were drawing this issue, uh, were there other art projects or jobs you were juggling such that hitting this deadline was also was was more stressful than just a normal deadline? Um, no, I didn't. I pretty much dedicated I don't, myself I don't mean to... to this one. Okay. I, this this is not to say that drawing twenty pages in twenty days or thirty days um, is it easy. It should be it should be um, very yeah. possible. It is possible for lots of people, and I'm amazed by that. Like, I don't know how people do it, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I definitely cleared my slate for this, and it was mm. nice. It was really fun. Good experience. I was I was thinking about sort of your art style and particularly the in in this in this book, and it kind it kind of feels like it's sort of fall somewhere in in the middle of a few of uh, sort of the key gi joe recent gi joe mm-hmm. artists that that sort of you know not a million miles away from the 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 uh, sl gallant and and robert atkins and and sort of possibly with a bit of that leaning to, towards uh billy penn's slightly more car- cartooning that we saw in a recent issue as 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 well so it's sort of somewhere in, in the middle of all of, of that is it is this what you you know would you call your natural style or, or were you kind of trying to adapt it to uh, a, in inverted commas, G.I. Joe style? I I would definitely, yeah, it's definitely a natural style. I don't, I'm not really conscious about style. It's more, it's more about storytelling. I'm not, but I'm not going to like do like mm-hmm. super cartoony anything like because this G.I. Joe and like I'm hired to draw G.I. Joe. I'm going to not make it super crazy or anything i used to draw more realistic i would say back like how i was saying influenced by like jim lee so it's all cross hatching and shadows but uh kind of painting has influenced me a lot too where there's not really any there's not really any black in the world like the color black it's all just different shades of light Mm. so i don't use heavy blacks that much anymore it would that would make drawing actually easy because you know heavy blacks are kind of a shortcut (laughs) but (laughs) <laughs> I and I don't do much cross hatching anymore either, unless I need like a like a specific gradient somewhere. Yeah, I was I was thinking about this myself. It's yeah, it's it's quite a a kind of open, yeah, uncluttered mm. style. I, I guess I'd, I'd say cool. that, that's um, good. That's what, kind of what I'm uh, going yeah. for. But it's also for efficiency reasons too. I feel like I mean there are shortcuts like the heavy blacks and stuff. But if you're cross hatching everything, then that's just going to take longer and stuff and. No one really appreciates it, I would say, unless it's like David Finch or something or Jim Lee. Mm-hmm. But <laughs> it's just not important to my art, so I kind of cut that out. Um, but yeah, uh, I'd say my style. Hmm. I mean, I do like manga and stuff like Katsuhiro Otomo from Akira and stuff like that. Definitely a huge influence in my life. But I don't really draw manga or anime, like stuff like that or. I'm kind of working on like create your own like it's kind of cartoony but it's not even cartoony. <laughs> it's weird. I don't know. Yeah, I don't I would say a middle of the road, I guess, kind of a nice little mix of everything. And I guess that that point you said about kind of storytelling is what comes across in terms of there's a on this issue there's quite a clarity about following the the story and it's it's not, you know, not overly cluttered and it's not uh it's not hampered by being trying to be too too clever about you know, flashy panel layouts mm. and stuff. It's it's something that we've discussed here a few t- few times. That um, sometimes the the more you know the more flashy styles uh, and and sort of in vertical comes clever kind of panel compositions mm-hmm. and stuff can sometimes be to the to the detriment of um, of actually the clarity of following following the story. Yeah, I'll slant some of those panels and stuff like you see in this issue. Yeah, we got a few a few sort of wedges and triangles. <laughs> But they're for like you know a reason. They're not just thrown in there for fun. It's definitely yeah, for emotion yeah, yeah, yeah. and drama and stuff. And or the uh, the the panel where the um, the casino dealer <laughs> uh, robot, where it a missile pops out mm-hmm. of its wrist. That panel is triangular shaped, yeah. but that matches the composition drawn within the panel. Exactly, it's supposed to guide your eye where the story needs your eye to go. It's a uh, form follows function. I would say with me. Like storytelling comes first mm. and the drawings are based upon that storytelling. When did you draw the cover? What was your, uh, what were your marching orders for the cover and what did you ink the cover with? Um, 
Actually, that's a the cover is a good guide into how what when I started this because I drew the cover a long time before I got the script. So let me look up when I drew that. Yeah, I remember I saw the cover ages mm -hmm. ago. <laughs> it was quite. It was like the middle of last year or yeah, something. Yeah, I drew the cover a long time. I remember seeing the the first solicitation came out and <laughs> I didn't have any script yet. <laughs> I was like, uh oh. So it looks like I was working on the cover in. July. Wow. Oh my god. I use a uh, usually Micron pens. I actually have a rap Rapidograph or whatever Ko I Noir uh, technical pens that I really like, but they get they're very they're divas. They're very um, hard to maintain. You ink with a Rapidograph pen. I tr the lines sometimes, but because I I like the ink uh, better. Oh, straight straight lines. Yeah. Straight lines. Uh, but for for oh, like okay. organic lines, I use usually brush or um, a felt tip brush pen that I really like because I like that because you can do long lines without having to refill the brush. But I just got into those like the past couple of years. But I'm still trying to find a good one that has really dark ink because they're all kind of they're not as dark as I would like opaque. Because I'm holding a Micron mm -hmm. right now, and and I I'm co-hosting the show, and I don't have to listen to this uh. later on, like all <laughs> our like all of our listeners do. Uh, what size Microns are you inking this cover with? Oh, uh, it's usually a <laughs> zero five. Mm, I'm, hold, I'm holding. Yeah, that's a zero like five. the average one, and then a zero eight usually for like thick lines if I need it. Sometimes I'll go down to a zero three for detail, but it's usually zero five. That's usually middle of the road. And then a lot of it's brush though. Like I try to use as much brush as possible just to get that nice flow. Right. And the, if you want the brush pens, I use a Faber Castell Pit Artist pen. I don't know anything about brush they're pens, uh, but hopefully some of our listeners are enjoying mm, that they're detail. They're very convenient. They're, they're great. <laughs> um, I would recommend them for sure. Um, I'm thinking about the timeline. If if the cover, if you drew the cover in July. It was so that presumably they could solicit the book in late July or August. Shops order um, two months ahead. So that puts us to September, November. And we know that this book is a mm. little late. Um, so right now it feels like you drawing this in July is like really early or a long time ago. It in feels the, like a lifetime ago. Sort of <laughs> like... In the like not quite pandemic or supply chain affected uh, publishing schedule of of IDW, mm. uh, drawing this cover in July sounds about right. Yeah, doing the forensics. <laughs> I think I think there's a, probably slightly more to it than that as well, Tim. That that um, they were they were sort of getting to the end of murder by assassination and sort of making an announcement about the next set of the next arc, which they call right. spotlight. So, so they kind of announced a lot of it all together rather than kind of the, n the more normal standard solicit uh, one yeah. issue. So, so we, we, uh, uh, yeah, towards, towards the end of the murder by assassination arc, we got quite a, uh, a good line of sight into the most of, most of the next arc. So, so I think we found out, about this fair affair ahead of its actual office, official solicit window. Yeah, they, they prepared right, very well. Right. Um, yeah. Would you, Casey, would you, so uh, Maria Keen, who inked this issue, inked this issue digitally. Mm -hmm. would, you, would you consider drawing a comic book in, in Procreate or in Photoshop? Um, last, I made a transition to digital kind of in, if you read The Last Fall from IDW, me and Tom's uh, creator-owned work, which we really want to return to someday that the first issue was inked and stuff and then about halfway through the second issue i finally got a, a wacom Cintiq tablet so i ended up drawing the rest of that series on digitally mm. and you can kind of see it because just like you know pens just have that rougher texture and the paper texture of course but uh yeah i learned a lot on that book too it, in terms of process and stuff but now it's i like to have the finished project be analog, but I'll use any tools available to me to get to that point. Do you sell your art? Will you sell this art? Oh uh, yeah, a lot of the covers get sold, and I've had some interest already in the interior cover or pages from a couple sources. So, aha, uh -huh. so, <laughs> that cool. picture is uh, of the pages is is bait for anybody. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's on the bedroom. It's like a it's a boudoir picture, you know. 
Uh, a, a game that I play when I see something like this, someone posts every page from an issue, I, th- I, I ask myself, okay, if I could only <laughs> buy one page, what page mm-hmm. would I buy? You know, this issue, there are no splash pages. That's true. Uh, huh? Every page has at least uh, two yeah, panels. I didn't think about that. And most of them have, most of them have at least three. And GI Joe usually has uh, a mm-hmm. splash page and sometimes two. You know, and there was that. There were issues in the like one hundred twenties, one hundred thirties, where oftentimes you turn the first page and page two, three was yeah. a splash spread with the title and credits. Since there are no splashes in this issue, uh, and not that I would necessarily like nab the mm-hmm. splash, but it's 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 sort of like like what issue has the most uh, like the most clever storytelling. I don't not 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 Mark's use of clever like overly flashy. Yeah. I mean, sort of precise and mm-hmm. careful uh, storytelling, or uh, just a very um, sensitive uh, pose or a bit of uh, body language. And uh, looking at this photo that's on your Instagram of every page, uh, I'm leaning towards, uh, in this hypothetical by uh, <laughs> page seven, seven, which is where, um, six, seven, where Dawn kicks the gun out of the cop's hand, tosses her rifle mm. to Helix, and then they walk in uh, to the, they walk through the gate because it's got uh, both of them. Uh, you can see both of their costumes. But I really like how the camera is high in the first panel, low in the second and third panels, uh, a little low in the fourth panel, and sort of low again in the fifth panel. It's uh, the, the the POV in this, and the whole issue is uh, thoughtful and uh, and and clear. Yeah, I got rules that I live by. Like, I don't think they're hurting. It makes it a little difficult sometimes, but like I said, the form follows the function. If I have a challenge, usually it helps in a way to narrow it down. Like I'm not dealing with infinite possibilities of what to draw. It's like these people have to say these things in this order. I have to have these items in this panel. I need these characters in the panel. It's like, what do I need to show the reader? And then it all works out in the end usually. But that was a really fun page. I like the page or the panel where they're running towards the dome. It's like very, I don't know. You picture like a guitar solo going right there or something, you know, like me. <laughs> and I, you know what? Actually, I feel like I feel like maybe I picked the obvious one because while there is no full page splash in this issue, that panel at the bottom with Helix and Dawn walking toward us, since they are unobstructed and mm-hmm. full figured, you can see all of them and you can see all their costume. I feel like that's actually the page that a fan would go towards, like an art dealer, like the guys who sell original art online yeah. would call that out. Uh, it's like you know, you buy a page of Batman, you want. The like you want to know you got a Batman the page. page where a two thirds, yeah, not like you know the back <laughs> of his head, uh, like in the Batmobile, and then like a couple mm. bystanders talking. Uh, so you know what I think? I think I'm gonna let someone else <laughs> buy this page. No, nah, thanks <laughs> for in, hyping it up. In I, this <laughs> but I think I think I might go for uh, the next page actually because mm. I personally like drawing backgrounds more Oof, than drawing yeah, that figures. Rough. <laughs> and. The uh, this whole um, factory thing inside the geodesic dome uh, that that uh, the, uh, the the blonde uh, salesperson is uh, present. Thank you, is presenting to Mindbender uh, and our our, our yeah. CG. And you almost got full body shot. Well, I guess you do full um, body shots of everybody in that page too. Then we check back in with Dawn and Helix. Uh, on the roof actually doing the business of using that wrench uh, like sneaking into this using the wrench right which which answers a question because a page earlier i wrote what's dawn got i did not (laughs) and i I drew just to be honest i hated that wrench i was like okay i gotta make sure i got this wrench in all these panels like you see in panel one page one and it's gotta be there the whole time Very specific wrench. Was were you given reference? Yeah. Use this yeah, wrench. It's uh, pretty much what uh-huh. I think Larry actually picks out a lot of the reference himself. Like I got some files. So mm. that was very helpful. This yeah, this is a geodesic um <laughs> structure panel wrench. Yeah. It was a it's like a it's a <laughs> do, wrench. Do you have one of those in the back of the vamp? Yep. It's like a tank a tank wrench for like treads on tanks. Yeah. Oh right. So it's very oh, you wow. know, he knows okay. all his military stuff, of course, so he knows exactly what he wants. 
the uh, the the cop mm-hmm. who uh, follows them, mm-hmm. McGovern, um, did the plot call out that this uh, character might resemble someone, or did you decide that this character? might? No, he just kind of came out of me. <laughs> like I, would, like okay, just, just evolved just over guy. the sketches, and like okay, this is what he looks like. Yeah, just some guy. But he did specifically say his name is McGovern, and he wanted to see it on the name tag. But he wanted the name tag uh-huh. on the panel where Don kicks the gun out of his hand. You can kind of see it. I don't know if it made it through. It's probably too small. But it is too small. But I put it in as as soon as I could and got a close shot of him because you don't have any close shots of him. I feel like. Yeah, I noticed it. Yeah, in the first in the first appearance. Uh, as I was doing That's my good. Notes. Yeah, That's a good thing. Govern there. So uh, it feels like we're well and truly getting into the, into the <laughs> yeah, issue. So, <laughs> <laughs> so let's let's get let's let's officially get started. Cool. This sounds fun. Comic, comic talk. talk. Oh, comic talk. talk. Larry Hammer writes them. Tim and Mark discuss them. Whoa. Comic talk. Oh, comic talk. Larry Hammer writes them. Tim and Mark discuss them. Whoa. Okay, so this is uh, issue 289, uh, released just this week, gone in February. Uh, writer, as always, Larry Hammer. Artist, Casey Maloney. Inks, Maria Keane. Colours, Jay Brown. Letters, Neil Utake. Senior editor, Tom Waltz. Editor, Megan Brown. And research specialist, Diana Davis. Let's have a look at the covers in the gallery. <laughs> We have been inundated by covers this month. We have got eight covers of the book this time, so so let's uh, let's sort of skip by them fairly quickly because otherwise we'll be here all day. I'll I'll just do a, a run through of what we've got. Uh, cover A is a continuation of the uh, Freddie Williams uh, multi-part cover. This time it's uh, Flint and Jinx um, with. The Flint and, and Jinx's eyeballs looking fairly white there, sort of almost blanked out, which is a little bit eerie for me, but there we go. Uh, cover B is uh, the Casey Maloney uh, cover with uh, colours by Jay Brown. Cover R.I. is uh, Kenneth Lowe uh, with Dawn and Helix. Again, themed to this uh, story. Uh, he uh, did the backup stories for the Da, 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 what's it called? Silent option. option. I'm a big fan. Silent big option. Fan of Kenneth Lowe, by the way. Miniseries. Shout out to him. I like his style a lot. And then, uh, then the re- the retailer exclusives. We've got uh, Clan McDonald by Nathan. Um, what does that say? Nathan. How would you say that, Tim? Uh, Shirty. <laughs> Thank you. With uh, Baroness, fairly by the books. Baroness two by John Yang. Uh, retailer exclusives for Eastside Comics, a, a quite in-your-face uh, uh, close-up of pun Destro uh, in, in his... Pardon? I said pun intended. <laughs> uh, uh, just with, uh, yeah, with his regular uh, outfit and then the, the pimp daddy Destro accompanying it. Uh, we've got uh, Kir- Kirill Ripin, retailer exclusive, again by for Eastside Comics of uh, Baroness framed by uh, a full moon and then a VA Comic Con retailer exclusive cover with art by Larry Hammer and Steve Leolola with uh, uh, Snake Eyes and Timber flanked by uh, Storm Shadow in his V1 Cobra outfit. Tim, do you want to sort of highlight some of your thoughts on these? Yeah. So in previous episodes, I've, I've talked about the odd compositions that you get from taking a three-part or four-part or five-part cover, like the um, Freddie Williams II uh, G.I. Joe images we've been getting for a couple issues, where it works together as a single like, poster, or if it was all on one comic book and it was the front cover, back cover, and then it folded out to show the rest of the image. Um, but when you chop it up, any one cover by itself is awkward. And the example that I have is from 1993, DC did a Legion of Superheroes spinoff called Legionnaires. And um, issues two, three, four, and five, and six were a five-part connecting cover. 
and they were all drawn by uh, Chris Sprouse, who was the interior artist uh, on the on that series, and inked by Carl Story. And um, each of them on their own is uh, like a good cover, and one of them's a great cover. But issue four in particular, um, it just has all this weird negative space that like is screaming for three more characters or some some copy. So nothing new to add for uh, the Freddie Williams the second cover. Uh, Casey Maloney's cover to me is actually the cover of this issue, right? I, I prefer that cover A be the thing that best illustrates the interior, right? Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, if we're gonna have like a random Serpentor drawing for one of the covers on this issue, like that shouldn't be cover A because mm-hmm. he's dead. Uh, Serpentor has nothing to do with this comic. Yeah. That was just an example. So um, Mr. Maloney's cover here with uh, Helix and uh, Snake Eyes Don Marino is fun and exciting. One of them's upside down. One of them's right side up. They're both in the air. This feels very much like an image that would connect with a uh, over-the-top like 90s action movie. That's sort of what I see and hear when I look at this cover because there's a giant explosion behind them. I, I, would, I would prefer that... Uh, uh, someone in design at IDW let Snake Eyes' leg come in front of the G.I. Joe logo, but okay. Um, it's still uh, it's still a very fun cover. Um, and I, th- I think when, when this one actually was made public, I tweeted uh, at Nitho Diaz and went, Nitho, look, someone's using your design for... for oh, is that you? I saw that. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, he, he was a, I yeah. definitely kept his references that they sent me. He was the one I focused on. Because we've established uh, on this podcast that um, Helix has a costume for the sort of quote Chuck Dixon continuity as well as for the real American hero Larry Hama continuity, uh, two different costumes. Her toy is different too. Right, right. And it's it's the Kenneth Lowe cover uh, features the the previous uh, design, which is the more toy based design. So the Kenneth Lowe, oh man, I want to talk about Kenneth Lowe. So Kenneth Lowe uh, drew these these backups uh, in Silent Option. This was this side Larry Hama miniseries. The backups were not written by Larry Hama. They were written by uh, mm. Ryan Ferrier. And I liked that story, but I was sort of torn because I feel like the Real American Hero continuity is so synonymous with Larry Hama. Mm. If you're going to have extra story pages, Hama should also mm. write those. Kenneth Lowe's interiors, and it was... It was like only four or six uh, pages per issue. Um, His interiors were like, were so gorgeous and thrilling. Like this guy can draw. And his colors too. His colors. Yes. Yes. Um, His, his, his brushwork, his inking is, it's this really unusual combination. It's loose, but it's quite Mm. precise. It's like he knows what he's doing. Um, it's, I don't even want to say it's, it's, it's gestural cause it's, it's more structural. Um, so it's just, uh, Snake Eyes, Don Reno and Helix standing there, each of them in a pose sort of at the ready with, um, not really any background, just sort of some ink in the background to create some negative space. Color is understated and gorgeous. Uh, both of them look, uh, I mean, hot, like exciting, like hot, like this is a hot cover. I don't mean... I don't mean like Jim Lee X Men 1991, <laughs> though I like that too. Um, uh, man, if Kenneth Lowe could could do more GI Joe, particularly more Larry yeah. Hama GI Joe. Yeah, I wonder if he happy. works digitally and traditionally, or what his process is. You guys haven't talked to him at all, or no? Oh. Yeah, no. I mean, it looks. I mean, the the coloring on it is very suggestive of you know yeah, quite watery, sure. um, you know, watercolors. The digital digital tools have gotten oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, amazing exactly. in yeah. the last couple of years. Um, that that this whole thing could be digital, and we we might, unless we ask yeah, him, definitely. we might never know. Mark, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Mark, our guest wants to pick our next Future guest. Yeah, I'm dying to know myself. Uh, and then out of the remaining uh, exclusive covers, Tim, if if you weren't going to pick the Larry Hammer cover, which which one do you think you would be be drawn towards? Um, uh, the two Baroness ones are, um, uh, in your words, um, sort of by the book, but I, you know, nothing against them. Um, Prophet Director Destro, I'm a little torn on this character because I feel like, um, 
I feel like it's it's a it's a joke that's gone too far. Uh, like he he hasn't shown up in the comic, so I'm sort of not sure what he's doing on the cover. You know, it's like it's like the Serpentor variant cover for this issue that doesn't exist. Like Destro's not in this cover, and Prophet Director Destro's definitely not in this cover. Um, all that said, I think uh, John Gang's um, Jiang's uh, the the regular Destro cover that is Destro's normal costume. There doesn't appear to be. I'm just looking at a thumbnail. It doesn't appear to be a logo, mm-hmm. so it's just a virgin cover. And it's such a bold, compelling composition, which you tend not to get because you usually can't put a pair of eyes in the top mm-hmm. third of a cover. Um, otherwise, Dawn, Dawn's leg gets <laughs> cut off by the logo. Uh, so I like this image, and, and there's, a, there's a harshness to Destro's uh, face. Um, I will say that um, both these Destro covers and also the second um, Baroness uh, exclusive cover have the um, like the sparks, like the fire the bits of fire sparks shooting up from the bottom of the cover, which also showed up on all of the uh, Rise of Cobra Interesting. movie I posters. That. And and this is a thing that like is in like exciting yeah. images nowadays. Like you see this on covers, you see this in movie posters where someone, some kind of action character is standing, and there are like little glints of like burning embers that have been added in Photoshop that like it's like Channing Tatum <laughs> holding this prop gun in front of a photographer. There was not also like a big like brazier of coals in front of him that someone <laughs> shook and there's a little fan blowing like bits of glowing orange past him uh, for the photographer. And I like it. I think we might be getting to where it's overdone in, in movie posters and covers. Now I'm going to be looking for that everywhere I look. <laughs> So let's let's find out what actually happened in the story of this issue with a plot breakdown. In New Orleans, Dawn and Helix are tracking an Aspid helicopter in pursuit uh, in their vamp with aerial support from the Phantom. Dr. Mindbender and Crimson Guard Laura 343 are en route to Revanche, who are producing upgraded bats for Cobra Island casino staff at the Revanche facility, a geodesic dome on the site of a former locomotive shed. Patrolman McGovern of the Baton Rouge Police Force wants to pull over the Joes to see their credentials, but they can't mid-mission and instead launch a drone while stopped at the traffic lights, which follows the helicopter to the facility. Dawn and Helix break into the facility, putting the patrolman in his place and leaving him at the gates. Hal gives Cobra a tour of the facility and a demo of the offensive capabilities of the casino model, Betty, targeting hostiles with a rifle, mini launchers in her forearms, retractable titanium daggers. She spews napalm and demonstrates her personal combat abilities. Mindbender intends to create Cobra's casinos all over the world, populated by a staff of the female robots. Spying all of this, Helix recognises the close combat techniques as being her mum's unique style. But then a ceiling panel breaks loose, giving away their location. They egress, pursued by a Betty in full berserker mode. They fight to a fat standstill until the robot raises its armoured faceplate to lock onto the aerial drone and Dawn seizes the moment to stick her through the head with a sword. And in the epilogue, Hal reveals himself to be Alpha 001 and his own plot to have his sleeper agents inside the Cobra Casino. It's a double sleeper! <laughs> so... <laughs> Talking points. Uh, where would you like to begin, uh, Tim? What's your suggestion? Uh, maybe the maybe the general comparison is to previous issues, which have all been uh, spotlights. How this, mm-hmm. you know, some issues were uh, more one character, some were a pair or a trio. You know, your comment on the last issue, which focused on. A couple of Joes ended up kind of being, though it was a flashback, sort of a regular issue, and it wasn't just a spotlight on a couple of Joes. It was it was several sets of characters. So, though there are just two Joes in this, uh, the opening scene has another Joe in it, and uh, this is pushing forward some Cobra and Revanche plot. We we had the introduction of the casino on Cobra Island when we went mm-hmm. back to Cobra Island. Just was it one issue ago or two issues ago? Two issues ago. Thank you. And 
we haven't checked in with the Blue Ninjas in a while. Mm. Uh, I think we need to say this out loud. This is Larry Hama's first meaty use of Helix in the main book. Mm. Right? So she mm. was introduced in a different continuity. He started using her in a silent option. And I'm trying to think, has she shown up just sort of incidentally between yeah. silent option and now? Incidentally. So she was uh, sort of in amongst uh, the ninja group. So um, she was sort of training with Snake Eyes at the very beginning of the Snake Hunt arc. And there were some sequences where all of the ninjas went out for a meal and, and she was there for that. That's right. Um, it was somebody's birthday, Sean's birthday, perhaps. Yeah, so so sort of incidentally, but yeah, less not really a main a main focus character, but yeah, I think she'll sort of exploring a little bit of that that aspect of uh, Helix, maybe being kind of a, a little bit emotionally disengaged uh, and and so on, um, and then sort of being welcomed into that kind of uh, ninja family unit. Yeah, I like her character um, a lot. I think there's lots of room to grow with her. I think there's there's a lovely there's a lovely bit of bluntness that I that I liked, uh, which was when um, the police uh, the police agent is talking to her. Oh, yeah. He said, uh, "He goes, I said pull over," and and she just says, "Will you shut up?" <laughs> it's just <laughs> just super blunt. Yeah, that was that was specifically in the plot too. It says Helix tells him to shut up. <laughs> yeah, so in in Hama's plots, even though he's not writing out dialogue, he does um, uh, lead with some indications of dialogue. Yeah, there's some stuff that you can tell he really wants in there. Mm. So we're 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 pushing forward with the uh, Cobra Casino. If we had suspected that it wasn't just a way to make money and create tourism on Cobra Island, if this feels sort of like all the terror drones popping up in mm. ah, was it issue. Was it issue 101, 100, 103, when Cobra's putting pterodromes everywhere? Yeah, 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 I know that. Um, uh, so something like that again. And uh, while I know that um, for some, the Blue Ninjas, um, the storyline is uh, not, not a favorite. I do think um, there's something to be said for Larry Hama... Um, sort of taking the temperature of technology um, and in the way that like in 1983, the brainwave scanner was fantasy. And now when it shows up in G.I. Joe, we're like, oh, we've seen that. That's old news. But like, that's where technology is now in the real world. And I think, you know, say what you will about what has been done with the Blue Ninjas or how often they've shown up. I think the fact that Hama is using them as a faction and uh, as a challenge for uh, the Joes and maybe as a threat for Cobra and everyone in addition. Um, you know, like he's not going to make a G.I. Joe story about like using your phone too much <laughs> or like a Joe, uh, like, you know, back at the pit, someone's like, oh, I can't get mainframe to stop playing solitaire, you know, like on his on his 1996 <laughs> Mac, you know, an issue like 150 of G.I. Joe, like not that. Um, I think Haba is aware of what is happening in science and te technology to some degree, and he's going to incorporate it a bit. And, uh, you know, we may never know sort of like are, are you know the rise of the machines in five or 20 or 30 years and we real humanity not in the comic books are are in trouble but hmm. i like that they're here uh and i'm sort of waiting for them to turn on cobra yeah um, i'm also i'm also really excited to see um uh remind me what's our what's our crimson guards person's name again uh, laura three four three laura thank you um i'm glad to see her back because She's awesome. I really, I've enjoyed all of her appearances so far. I like her too. Uh, I'm, I'm always, I'm a little torn on on Mindbender because I feel like uh, there are so many other interesting individuals in Cobra, like you know Xandar or Gristle or Scrap Iron, who could do something like this in a certain story and. Um, Mindbender is definitely well used here. I'm less interested in him when he's like just there, so Cobra Commander is not talking to himself. 
Mm-hmm. And I feel like that has happened more in the last three years of Real American Hero. Like I want Mindbender to be specifically doing technological stuff. Yeah. Like his in his specialty, Master of Mind Control, which I take as interrogator. Um, and I often uh, in, uh, incorrectly just call him Cobra's interrogator. Hmm. Uh, so, you know, whether he's very generically a mad scientist or um, he's, he should be dealing with something specific like the brainwave scanner. This issue, sorry, the, the, the top line, my top line response to this issue was overall, it felt like a transition issue. It felt like a middle chapter. And that's not as exciting to me as the occasional self-contained issue that has a, a real bang of a beginning, middle, and end, or a like multi-chapter story, first chapter or final chapter, where things are getting set up or things are coming to a head. Uh, mm-hmm. And this issue mm-hmm. sort of felt short to me when mm-hmm. I read it. Like I know it's the standard 20 pages. I think on the reread, mm-hmm. I'll realize that a lot did happen. And this issue is more character stuff uh, than action and choreography. Yeah, it's a slightly slightly more linear than a lot of yeah issues that that we've we've got with there. It's lots and lots of scenes and a very big cast of characters being juggled. We've got a cl- much a, th- a thinner cast of characters and and a, a more sort of yeah more linear following those those cast from a beginning of the story to the end. Yeah, I feel like I got lucky, honestly. <laughs> True like, <laughs> for the artist, it's not globe trotting. Like all the GI Joes, like I've looked at all like the reference that they say. I read a lot of the comics and stuff, and there's like crazy stuff, <laughs> like all so many characters and references, and that would be so hard to do. But yeah, I definitely got off easy on this one. <laughs> nice. And yet, you still have to draw uh, difficult to draw things like a vamp, uh, a stealth, the inside of a cockpit. Uh, yeah, the vehicles and everything. Uh, uh, the whatever is inside this geodesic dome. Mm. So there's, yeah, you know, but luckily, unless... the, like, there's so much stuff for like reference for GI Joe, like just all the toy websites and the Wikipedia's and the Joepedia's and all that stuff, and it's such a helpful thing. It makes it easier. Did you, um, did IDW provide you with whole issues or any kind of like packet of character uh, images? Yeah, the, uh, lots of PDFs, a lot of the graphic novels and stuff. So I read all that the silent like my my chronology in my head is all mixed up because i read them all mixed up just looking for reference and stuff but i read them all but i'm not sure what happens when and <laughs> when what comes before what right now but i'm all mixed up but i got well, a lot I can of assure you I, I can assure you no matter how many times i refer to the serpenter variant cover on this issue <laughs> serpenter is not not alive <laughs> yet when did he die uh it was like two the first two, time 213 <laughs> Two th- oh, a while back okay. that was the second time he died yeah was it um, 70, uh, 74 75 76 so so my top top line for this uh one is probably sort of my initial reaction was sort of going blue ninjas again oh man <laughs> but um you know mulling it mulling it over sort of just like the the original kind of marvel era or sort of G.I. Joe, the, the long story of that was was basically, you know, the Snake Eyes and Storm Shadow story. And, you know, that got resolved and that kind of meant that some of that momentum and fizz of an excitement of, of that that kind of era kind of, it didn't, it felt like some of the the drive kind of drop, dropped out. Um, and and I think for the IDW era, the the long the long story for, for the IDW era has been kind of that, blue ninja story and and you know it has been left open and un, unresolved with there's still a lot of mystery there we do you know about the origins and uh and the sort of the the ongoing sort of threat of alpha that we we sort of saw at the beginning of the snake hunts um arc but but then didn't didn't sort of materialize as a as a threat during that that story um, so, so you know, it has been left over, and the other side of my brain is is like, you know, I want plot threads to be resolved, and I want that long story to be played out. So there's kind of two two aspects to it, sort sort of you know, pulling in different directions. I know, sort of Blue Ninjas generally haven't been massively fan, you know, well received by fans, but um, I think as we as we you know, get sort of draw towards the end at the end point of the the 300 issues 
you know it does feel like that that has to be an element of it of that part of the story playing out so uh you know kind of kind of make makes sense and and if it wasn't resolved in some satisfying way i think it would it, you know it would be the outs outstanding kind of aspect of the of the story um so you know there we there, there we go it's uh it's it's kind of pulling me in in two di- directions hmm. um there was a, a new mystery i guess introduced in the in the story as well the helix mystery of of her mother's fighting style being uh adopted by betty the robot and i think back to silent option uh, there was there were strong hints that her mother was trained by the the blind master so yeah a bit of a, a a new mystery introduced about how helix's mother is uh linked to this yeah casey what do you what do you think the deal with helix's <laughs> mom is i don't know it's kind of creepy honestly i was creeped out by it like i thought that was actually like kind of the heaviest note of this issue it's like i don't know it's like your mom's ghost it's kind of creepy i think and like at the end when she's fighting Betty in the swamp and she looks at her when they're I'm looking at it right now where like they cross weapons, you know, for like one that one second before the drone comes through at the end. Mm-hmm. I don't know, I thought that'd be really heavy, like her them just staring at each other down like that and like I can't imagine what Helix was feeling, but when the dialogue was put over it it makes it much more lighthearted where she's saying nice counter but saw it coming that one too huh it's like laughing about it right but i drew it more like heavy in my head i was picturing like i'm fighting like i'm fighting this machine but i'm thinking about my mom like i think that would screw your head up a little bit personally Mm. those those panels there together i think it's quite effective it's sort of showing the flashback and the present time sort of running together in in parallel that she's fighting betty in present but then she's you know at the same time she's flashing back and thinking of training against her her mum so yeah as you say she's fighting betty but she's also fighting her mum at the same time yeah those are probably my favorite panels my my most proud panels those flashback ones that are linked with the present ones like it's kind of like that's kind of storytelling is kind of only possible in comics i mm. feel that's why i love comics so much you know like you can't really do that anywhere else those those two panels, right? At the end of the episode, Mark may ask me what my favorite line of dialogue is. I do know my two favorite panels, and that is this this third to last page of the issue, page 18, where, yes, we see in a uh, very clear profile from far away this fight choreography happening both in the past and also paralleled in the present. Um, something else that occurs to me sort of on, on the reread having it in front of me open right now those next two panels where betty is has brought her two arm swords down and helix has has stopped them from slashing her helix is it's it's um it's almost cropped out of these two panels or it's slightly it's not sort of the main part of these two panels helix is keeping these two swords from chopping her up with her two pistols Mm -hmm. yeah like we're, we're used to sword fights where you can hold one sword at bay with your sword, uh, Helix is doing it with two small sidearms. Yeah, it's cool, huh? <laughs> Very ninja. She's a gun fu expert. Gun ninja, yeah. Gun fu. I I had one question, which maybe one of you can help me with, um, mm-hmm. and and it was the line of dialogue um, from Hal. He says, "This is our casino dealer model. We call her Betty. Ha ha. Get it? I didn't get it." Can can you help me? Uh, like bet, like gamble. Yeah, like you're placing a oh, bet. Oh, bet. <laughs> oh, okay. My, so I did not get it the first time, and then later I thought, oh, is it because she's kind of a bat? And oh. if you say bat really fast, you bat See? Betty, Betty bet. Uh, but yes, that's yeah, that's just my theory. The bet is my theory. I don't know if it's right or not. I I don't have inside information. No, that makes much, sense. That makes much most sense. Yeah, I was thinking Betty Boo. <laughs> I also I appreciate know. the restraint on the part of the writer to not explain the joke, because yeah. if you get it, you can think to yourself, how smart I am. And if you get it and then <laughs> like Mindbender explains it in the next panel, you're like, I know. <laughs> yeah. Um, A joke is not funny if it's explained. I spy, I spy with, with my, my little eye. eye. Uh, okay. Uh, I've got three eye spies. 
Have you got any, Tim? Uh, yeah, I've got one and a half. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, I'll go. Int- curious, curious. I'll start with a, a low bar. So, so they, they're in the vamp. They say this is vamp three to Phantom One Niner, and I thought vamp three is that a vamp mark three? Because, and then I looked it up, and there's a vamp mark one, which is you know the the green well known one. There's a vamp mark two, which is the kind of the more tan with the missile rack, and there's also a vamp mark four, but there isn't a vamp mark mark three as far as I could I could tell. But then looking at the dialogue, it's you know, it's vamp three. So that's just like a call sign that could just be a regular vamp. So it uh, looks like it's just a regular old vamp one with a special drone missile rack on it. Um, that was that was half of uh, uh, I Spy for me. Have we seen a vamp previously where we don't see the missiles or the, the machine guns on it and we instead see a canister for like missiles or drones? Because when I saw in, in panel one of page one, I thought, what is up with this vamp? And then it mm-hmm. occurred to me um, that like when the cop pulls them over, he's doing it because they look like they're about to commit a crime or mm-hmm. they've just committed a crime. <laughs> and so Hama might be thinking, oh, you know, if this has like, if this is brimming with missiles, they're going to get pulled over. How can I sort of notch this down? But then I also thought, oh, well, maybe that's actually what, like, that's what a drone launcher looks like these days. You know, like, like when you see the G.I. Joe's Wolverine tank, real tanks right now that fire missiles, I don't think you can see that much of the missile sticking out of them. The, mm-hmm. the sort of container for them is deeper and you just see the hole, I think. Yeah, this is based specifically on reference that Larry Hama sent. Like, okay. it has two canisters like that on the back of a pickup truck, actually. Okay. And it shoots out a drone just like that. It's really cool. Uh-huh. All right. Um, my my other I spy was uh, was Ghost Rider, the pilot of uh, the GI Joe stealth jet. We haven't seen him in a little while, and not only does Hama not explain the the Betty joke, he doesn't do the the like someone can't remember Ghost Rider's <laughs> name or doesn't want to say <laughs> it out loud joke. Which I like at first I was like, oh, do the joke, and then I thought. No, that's fine. Like we I, we know who this is. You, I can enjoy it without the joke being done. But actually, my eye spy here is man. Look at how many cobras Ghost Rider yeah. has shot down. Oh yeah, panel, panel two of page one. I counted. He's forty two. Oh yeah, that was my joke. <laughs> that's, that's great. He's an eight. He's an ace. <laughs> yeah, I put that in for fun. But it's funny that they did uh, in the emails. Tom and Megan stuff were making that joke so it did live on it's just not in the script oh uh-huh. cool he's a yeah he's he's a killing cobra killing machine um yeah. <laughs> the, well, i imagine he's been doing it a long time you know he's got the great phantom yeah absolutely he's yeah. taking out a good amount of them yeah that that ghost rider not you know them them not mentioning that they can't remember his name it's almost like an anti-hammer time it's like <laughs> you know stop yeah we're not seeing the thing that we're used to seeing <laughs> Maybe it's uh, like Tomax and Zaymat, and you have to spell uh, Hammer Time backwards. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's. Uh, I'm sure I'll, I'll be back. I'll, I'll record that and then I'll spin it backwards. Master <laughs> Mac. Okay. Um, my final I spy was uh, the robot introducing himself as I'm Hal, which uh, obviously is uh, a reference back to the computer that took over command of the spaceship in. Stanley Kubrick's film 2001 A Space Odyssey and apparently HAL stands for in that film heuristically programmed algorithmic computer and pop fact each letter in HAL precedes the letters IBM H I A B L M that's, That's cool. fun. Um, I have not quite an I spy. Um, I I note. I don't think this is a reference. Uh, this is a. I think a coincidence that I noticed, uh, and I'm ascribing it to be a pattern. When Hal is describing Betty's features, and she has retractable, razor sharp titanium daggers that pop out of her uh, wrists, and then a couple pages later. Hal says, now for a practical demonstration, in full berserker mode, (laughs) I couldn't help but think this is not a reference to Wolverine, who has sharp things that come out of his arms, Mm. and who goes into a berserker rage in lots of X-Men comics, and of course Larry Hama wrote lots of Wolverine comics, but still. (laughs) It's just a good word, I think. 
so Casey, is there is there any sort of little nuggets of detail that are hidden inside the book that you'd like to call out that we've we've not mentioned so far? Or something that's the other thing that was really hard to draw that we haven't properly complimented you on. <laughs> uh, let me see real quick. I'm scrolling through it. I mean, just the like the dome was really hard, but once like you're saying if you were on that page with the background, if you had that page, the dome wouldn't be in the background because I add it as a layer digitally. Right. Some of them, the dome is drawn. Like when it's close up, it's drawn, like the the beams and stuff. But when it's far away, that's mm-hmm. all just a layer that's added digitally. Because I, <laughs> right away, I was like, I am not drawing that <laughs> over and over again because <laughs> it wouldn't look good. I could not do that justice and stuff. But um, let's see, anything else? Uh, is uh, is Hal supposed to look like anyone or remind us of anyone? Uh, no, I just kind of drew a sleazy salesman, you know, kind of okay. style. Like he's always doing something with his hands, you know. He's like never letting you rest. If you look at him, he's always doing something with his hands, always moving, always waving or something or motioning at something. or Like he's always moving, always selling. Like he's just a salesman basically. Young go-getter, I'll say. And Alpha One at the end, I guess... Is is that a slightly new look for that that character? Yes, I feel like it's uh, one of those characters. It's always so so complicated. It always looks slightly different every time it's drawn. Exactly. Yeah, that was kind of the thing. It's interesting. He doesn't have a look. He's always some different evolution or mutation in all the books that I've read. Mm-hmm. Like at one point he's like like a pregnant robot, and then another one is like a spider like looking thing. So this was actually just kind of. They didn't tell me what he's going to look like, basically, at the end when he reveals himself. I asked, I was like, um, "Is he? what does he look like? Does he look like any of the previous forms? And they're like, oh, no, just do what you want. So I kind of just did stream of consciousness. I drew him kind of like, I don't know, like, like a router or, you know, a server just connected to everything because that's what I imagined he would be. And I drew him that way because I only had to draw him once. Like, I could not draw that character <laughs> over and over again in a comic, you know? So whoever draws him next, I'm sure will cut some of those tubes out and <laughs> Casey, whatever he looks like next. Before you go, speaking of drawing mm. something for G.I. Joe and over and over and over again, mm-hmm. any chance we'll see you drawing G.I. Joe again? Um, I did do a page for the Silent Interlude book. Aha! Uh-huh. A scoop! A scoop! Mark, yeah, we have a scoop. It- it turned out beautiful, I gotta say. I'm very proud of it. It's me, uh, just nice, heavy black inks and stuff, and some good old snake eyes. It's really nice, actually. I would love, I'll share it when, I don't know if I can share anything yet, but I'll, sh- I'll show you guys when I can. Yeah, a few, a few of the artists have, I think, shared theirs. So there, there are some out there. But yeah, that was really fun. That was, that was an interesting challenge, too, because you don't want to stray from the original because the storytelling is so good. Like, you can't change any of the storytelling, it's laid out perfectly. So you just kind of got to put your own spin on it. It's, yeah, a, 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 I think changing. a real thought challenge of, you know, how do you, you know, you've got a classic there on your hands. How mm. do you do something that isn't just tracing the original, which would be boring, but putting your own mark on it, but not going too far the other other way, given the fact that it, yeah. the original is a classic. And plus you're working on one page. So if you change something, then all the other pages are going to be messed up. Like either storytelling wise or mm. like layout yeah. background wise. I'm, I'm sort of waiting for one page like Snake Eyes to have a lot of belts and gears and punches <laughs> on him, and then the next page it's like ah, oh, sort of streamlined 1984. Exactly. Or Snake Eyes. I'm curious to see um, how it turns out. When did you draw the page? Uh, not too long ago. Pretty much right after I finished the book. So it was a nice little chaser. Right after, but it's, New it's sitting Year's. here right next to me actually. Hmm. Is that page for sale? <laughs> oh, man, Mark, the work it would take from some <laughs> intrepid collector to get all of these pages together. Yeah. Oh, yeah, from all the different artists. That'd be wow. amazing. Yeah, and then you, you get, you get what, like 20, is it 22 pages? How many pages were there? Yeah. Um, yeah, so yeah, you get 22. yeah 21, and then there's one artist that's already sold it or just won't let it go. You know? <laughs> then, yeah, then it turns into a globetrotting chase. Or someone drew it digitally and there is no object. Oh, yeah, that too. I'm sure a lot of them will be digital. Cool. So uh, I think that was uh, I Spy. Uh, if you guys want to do the one where you point out the faults, <laughs> we'll do that real quick. I got to get that out, of, out in the open. So er- error detected. Error detected. 
Error detected. No prize incoming. Um, I didn't actually have anything. Oh, I'm I'm firing nothing here. Um, sorry. My goodness. I also. I know Tim's got something. Uh, no, no, <laughs> no. I also uh, didn't have anything. Uh, I will admit to reading this issue a little closer to recording time and a little faster than some of our episodes. Um, mm. But I, I do think I have a pretty good frown. I mean, I, for <laughs> when I read this favorite comic book series of mine. Definitely. That's um, the, hope. the closest to an error detected, which is, you know, more more sort of pushing into the no prize territory is the, a question that I saw online, which was, this uh, this patrolman, where what do they call him? Patrolman McGovern. McGovern. How come? How come he's sort of just left there at the at the gates, and he doesn't he doesn't get back up? Um, given <laughs> given this sort of paramilitary threat on his his doorstep. Yeah, he was kind of. I found him like comedic in a way. Yeah, like, yeah. It's. Um, I mean, I it's, guess it's the comic relief I mean, touch, well, really, isn't it? Yeah. Even though time passes, like they come out later, and it's darker. But he's still there, you know. Like I imagine him. I don't know. He's just kind of impotent, I guess you could say. <laughs> you know, I do have. Uh, uh, I, it, this is not an error detective. I detected. I think this is a a a factual style decision that I would make differently. Mm-hmm. So everyone's calling her Dawn. I'm doing mm-hmm. it too, and that's that's who she is. That's sort of how we know her, and that is how she was introduced. Because initially, she was just some kid in the Cobra youth and she didn't have a code name, much less any costume or sort of G.I. Joe identity. But um, Helix calls her Dawn at least two times. And mm-hmm. uh, this is this is a mission. Yeah, and no I feel code like, name. Yeah, yeah. She, she has a code name. She's Snake Eyes. I know that like sort of no one, I know most of the fandom either isn't accepting it or there's a lot of, there's several decades of momentum mm-hmm. against this rolling off her tongue but you know like it's like when when i team up all those all those issues with uh like shipwreck like you know no one's like stop the blue ninjas hector <laughs> uh, yeah it's interesting like, but so, we've, we've got that we've got that slightly slightly nuanced dimension to it as well that we've got another snake eyes running around throwdown and they they yeah, sort Sean. of they tweaked tweaked his naming convention sort of is was it in 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 the run-up to snake hunt where they they said when we're out in missions make sure you always call him snake eyes yeah, and really not sean yeah. or throw down so yeah I've, the fact that there's two snake eyes makes makes it a bit harder yeah i'm rooting for dawn i hope that she i think she's a great snake eyes i like helix a lot i think they're two cool characters and they're cool together but i do hope that dawn is like you know snake eyes like for real and she is right now, and I hope she, I hope she gets the credit she deserves. Yeah, no mention of Snake Eyes in the in the issue in terms of calling Dawn by that name, but also no hint of that. Oh, really? Snake Eyes personality sort of coming through in you know in, in terms of that that download of Snake Eyes's memories into into Dawn's <laughs> brain that's previously yeah. has uh, surfaced. Um, oh, they don't say Snake Eyes at all, huh? They don't call her that at all. Or if they did, I missed it. This is—I don't, is, think, I don't think they do. This is, you know, oh, something something that happens in comics where, you know, it's like how many Thors are there? It's like, well, there's mm. Thor, Odin's son. There's Thor, Jane Foster. It's like, well, how many Iron Mans are there? It's like, well, R- Rhodey was Iron Man for a while, and then he got a different name and a different armor. Um, mm. Like, how many how many Batmans are there right now? Like in DC Comics this month, there are two different Batmans, and <laughs> in Marvel Comics this month, there are three different Spider Mans, yeah. and th- you know they're all just called like you know the title is Miles Morales, so the title is like Ben Riley Spider Man, um, and in the story, you know I'm not sure. I think when their costumes are on, they're just called Spider Man. So there is some comic book uh, sort of rule logic precedent already set here and i think what i really want more than dawn to get called by the right name or throwdown to get called by the right name is more stories for these characters to yeah. be able to become themselves mm. and become favorites and mm. you know original snake eyes has 34 years of history <laughs> built up as the favorite character 
and also just that much time. And it's hard to take a, a, a new version of something of an analog like Dawn, you know, th- that's going to be an uphill climb for, you know, the people who make Jejo and all the fans, which is why, as I've said in previous episodes, if this comic were just published weekly, there'd be so many more pages and so many more stories. <laughs> Uh, and, you know, Dawn could show up in half of them and, and very quickly we could have we could rack up a whole bunch of stories where Snake Eyes Don Marino uh, gets to be extra interesting and cool and talented and and people would see her as that much more her own character. Yeah, um, it just takes time and screen time. Like, yeah, not screen, but they panel, I mean, this panel, is definitely panel the space. right step. Yeah, panel space. Yeah, you get that out there. But this I'm glad that this came out because this is exactly what they needed, I think. Um, and you know, like going back to the uh, the annual from a couple years ago, that uh, where she's on the cover. I guess one of the covers she's on the cover, and the other cover is uh, Duke. You know, the main story is her sort of more. Hasn't some time passed, and now she's actually joining the team. Mm-hmm. Am I remembering mm-hmm. that correctly, Mark? Yeah, the story that, uh, yeah, that yeah. Kay Zama drew. That's the one where she's doing a training sequence um, th- just before so. she then joins the Joe team. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Um, Casey, where can where can people find you on the internet? Um, I've kind of been off social media a little bit, but I do have Instagram, uh, Case Malone, and I uh, got a Patreon account. I think it's my name, Casey Maloney, and then my just general website is just CaseyMaloneyArt dot com. But I actually don't have too much comic work up there. It's mostly just paintings and stuff on the main website, but. I'll update it soon, but that's about it. Those three places. If a G.I. Joe art collector uh, wanted to commission you to draw or paint something G.I. Joe, or is that is that a possibility? Uh, sure, if it's legal, <laughs> if I can get away with that. I don't know if I'd get sued or anything, but uh, I, I yeah, don't uh, think I don't think you would. <laughs> okay, I'll take your word for it. Um, I am not but, a yeah. lawyer, but I read <laughs> comics. <laughs> My website has a contact page where you can email me and stuff on caseymaloneyart.com. So cool. you can find me. I'm out there. Are you on Facebook? Uh, I'm connected. So like sometimes I'll post and I'll go to Facebook, but I don't go on Facebook. Okay. That is. Um, so yeah, thank you, Casey, for, for joining us. You've got to, you've got prior engagements to uh, dash off to. Um, so so we'll, we'll wrap up the, the rem- remainder of the show uh, without you but uh, yeah thanks for for joining us and letting letting us know all about the background details on uh, how this issue came about thank you for having me that was very fun it was nice to talk to you guys it's nice to talk about this stuff too because i sit around drawing it and <laughs> thinking it in my head and not talking about it so it's nice to get it out and open and we look forward to uh, your page as part of the 40th anniversary special in april yeah i hope you guys like it i like it so hope you do too yeah, and I was, I was going to say the the cat is probably a very good listener, but um, you know, her, <laughs> <laughs> is her, her criticism is a bit too cutting. Um, so, yeah, so you don't they, like they to can be <laughs> <laughs> Cool, good, cool beans. Yeah, thanks a lot, guys. Bye. So, uh, thanks to Casey for joining us, and let's uh, Charlie Mike with the the remaining uh, features for this issue. Hammer time. Stop. Have a time. time to beat the soles of your boots with my face For who's it blue ninjas? Have a time Page two, Felix says, that cop is giving us the hairy eyeball <laughs> uh, And and um, uh, both her dialogue here and Dawn's uh, dialogue here The font is smaller, showing that they're uh, whispering or speaking quietly But uh, uh, we have seen a uh, hairy eyeball in larry hama comics before true and it's such an evocative expression isn't it and i looked it looked it up to see see what people said about it it sort of it seems to have cropped up um as an americanism in the the mid 60s um and refers to a hostile suspicious or disapproving look but it can also mean almost exactly the opposite it can also it's also been used to mean flirtatious like sort of fluttering eyelids hmm 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 so uh what else do we have we uh, i just i can't i can't not mention in hammer time the fact that we've got the return of the blue ninjas uh in terms of a uh key story point 
uh, for the IDW. It is the hammerist of hammerisms. Uh, th- this isn't, I, I don't know, this is quite a, a, a hammer time or this observation that I make sometimes where Larry Hama is aware of the sort of physical nuts and bolts of a story. Mm-hmm. Um, but on both the first page and also a late page in this issue, there's some dialogue that I think is is very much that. So in panel three of the whole comic, page one, Ghost Rider says, the target may be using New Orleans as a waypoint to follow the river upstream. Baton Rouge could be the possible destination. And that would make sense because of the revanche connection, right? Mm-hmm. Like Hama is aware of where characters are in a scene, right? Like a fight, mm-hmm. but also this is a vehicle based line or it was initially. And these characters are covering great distances and there, there is motivating logic to how, say, the Joes follow the Cobras to this factory, to this um, lab. And then similarly... Yeah, just um, in the in the next panel to the one you were talking about, they're, they're flying the Aspid and they say, we're passing the Delta gold refinery on the Mississippi. This is the last waypoint before Baton Rouge. And they've talked about before in previous issues, uh, sort of described using kind of landmarks as a way of kind of navigating when you're you know flying uh, flying up in an airborne vehicle um so so yeah a real sense of kind of i guess how how a pilot might use geography to navigate but but also a i guess a real sense of g- probably genuine uh baton rouge geography of what is what is where and i bet i bet you that um locomotive shed is is it was probably spotted somewhere on on Google. There is probably a a real life roundhouse of a of a former locomotive railroad. Yeah. Um, another bit of dialogue like that uh, for me, where I feel, um, this is this is half of that thing where I think Hama is aware of the nuts and bolts of these characters and vehicles moving from point A to point B to point C, but also this stuff is all conspicuous because these costumes and these vehicles are, are outlandish. Mm -hmm. Uh, But on page three, Ghost Rider continues, even in super stealth mode, I can't be loitering over a metropolitan area. I'm peeling off here and recommending you launch a drone. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so he and the two Joes and the vamp are sort of triangulating with how they're going to finish tracking Mindbender in the Aspid. And like, I, I love this bit of dialogue because it's not my favorite line. It's my second favorite line because even though it is a stealth jet and even though whatever super stealth mode is, I don't know if that's a call out from the, the toy box for the stealth, if that's a real thing or if that's a little G.I. Joe-ism that Hama is inventing <laughs> for this scene, right? It sound, Whatever it is, it sounds great. But also what Hama is doing here is he's giving a limitation to the characters mm. that the vamp can't just go anywhere, that... This ninja and this computer brain woman can't just get into any building or can't do it perfectly, right? They're like like a piece of the the roof falls in because they were careless. And so they get discovered. Uh, But I don't think I have any other... uh, Hammerisms. Hammerisms. You'll you'll probably kick yourself for this, but but my observation as well is that we're starting in media res, in the midst of things. Mm. Uh, So we're kind of mid-mission already following the, the vamp and the phantom en route tracking this this helicopter you know we, we didn't get all of the briefing at the beginning of the thing of saying okay dawn and helix you know you're working together now and, and you know we're going to assign you a vamp and here's here's your aerial support and we've you know heard heard intel that there's a helicopter on blah 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 you know it's bam we're in the car uh they're they're, they're you know in right in the middle of things um and hammer makes it look easy because you know he, he, you know he's been doing this a long time and he's very good at it. But um, a lot of uh, writers, particularly sort of starting out, they they don't do that. They they sort of they do have to do the whole build, and and it's generally more I think effective to to put you in the middle of it. It sort of grabs you right from the outset. Quote of the week. 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 Do you have a favorite line of dialogue? I had written down 
about the hairy eyebrow. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, I didn't have a backup. Tim, what's uh, do, do you have one? Yeah. Before I do that, I want to do uh, my favorite sound effects. Let's talk about SFX, baby. Let's talk about pew and scree. Let's talk about shooting gun things and the sound effects. We'll see. Let's talk about SFX. Let's, Let's talk, talk about, about SFX. SFX. Once again, Neil Yotake does a does a really great job with one or two sound effects. The page where right after the flashback to Helix training with her mom as a kid, uh, we're looking up. Helix and Dawn are uh, looking through the hole in the roof and a piece of the inner panel of the ceiling breaks loose and is falling toward us. And then in the second panel, it has landed. Uh, S-H-K-K, the sound of a piece of uh, inner <laughs> roof paneling breaking off and perhaps also sliding against another piece as it enters the space. And then K-A-C-H-U-N-K, right? So shook and kachunk as that roof panel lands. And then Hal looks up and says, intruder alert! Uh, but Neil Yutake puts both of these sound effects into perspective. And particularly with the kachunk, uh, he puts it into a really forced sort of rounded, a, a very pinched one point perspective, even though it's curved. Um, so it's it's uh, receding from uh, left to right on the left side and then from right to left on the on the right side. And it, it feels very much, it looks and feels very much of a piece of the piece that is landing right there. So uh, I really like both of those, those uh, decisions. Uh, and then uh, going back um, on page three of the comic, when, <laughs> when the vamp pops a wheelie, <laughs> which I feel like that's just Larry Hama and or Casey Maloney just sort of ha- like having a joke, like having a laugh with us, because I don't think a vamp can do that. <laughs> Uh, I don't think. And when was the last time you saw a, a car pop a wheelie at the traffic lights? Uh, right. Like to do that, you know, you you need like a certain amount of weight distribution in your vehicle. It has to have a certain acceleration. You know, the friction of the tire or tires on the on the road. This this is really funny. This is it's almost dumb. It's so funny. <laughs> uh, I guess I guess there's the drone. Maybe if they're simultaneously shooting that drone out the back of the vehicle as well as driving away i don't know uh but there's there's a big sound effect there a scree uh my favorite line in this whole issue it's the last panel of the second to last page so uh snake eyes dawn marino has just impaled her sword through the robot's head the robot falls into the swamp and dawn says uh mainframe will be wanting to dissect this asap and helix says in two word balloons we have to winch the vamp back on its wheels and haul this thing to an airstrip where she can be airlifted to the pit. And just like that earlier bit of dialogue about peeling off the stealth and waypoint and halfway, um, it's like, oh, right. The vamp got flipped over and also blew up or got flipped over and is slightly damaged. It's too slow for these Joes to drive the this broken robot cross country. So I love that, like, that one sentence, like, that could be a whole three-page scene in the next issue, or if, you know, something like Special Missions were winning concurrently, if this was 1987, you know, it's like, oh, and see how Lift Ticket and uh, Mainframe, like, get into an adventure, uh, if they, <laughs> like, take, like, it's like, oh, we actually change of plans, uh, we got the, we got this broken Betty uh, robot onto a tomahawk and we're flying that back uh to the pit i just i just love in that bit of dialogue that it's like oh right we have this vehicle it flipped over we're in the swamp it's got a winch right you all know how excited i was about all the winching in the previous issue uh so much winching in the previous issue <laughs> um so because it's not like a cool badass line not because it's some like reveal of backstory it is a a very smart nuts and bolts line that expands the, the sort of the rest of this scene and the story that would perhaps continue if this issue were magically like double sized and had another 20 pages. It's like, no, we're going to follow up on this in an issue or two. We're going to be back at the pit. And I bet Hawk and Psych Out and Dial Tone and Mainframe and 
Lady J are, are going to be standing around some like table and there are going to be blue ninja parts and they're going to be talking and I can't wait. <laughs> Excellent. There was one more line uh, that I did write down, but that was for a Larry Hammer colloquialism. There used to be a pudding that was over egged. You know the pudding. You know the pudding. At first it was British, but then it was Commonwealth. You know the pudding. You know the pudding. But now there's a new player in town. A comic book writer of of some renown. He's using real world examples and peppering the issues with with lots of samples. It's a Larry Hammer colloquialism. He's talking G.I. Joe and all its heroism. Can you guess what it is? Is it something new? Now listen as Larry drops a slice of real life on you. So uh, I wrote down TCB from we have to TCB here and it would help if you could stay put and make sure nobody escapes this way. Uh, talking yeah, this one did trauma. not have an, this one did not have an asterisk. So did you, did you immediately know what TCB was? No, but I hoped you would. <laughs> so I, I don't think I got this one without the Google. Um, so, Oh, is it, sorry. Is it the first uh, three letters of uh, TCBY? The country's best yogurt, TCBY. She she wants frozen yogurt, right? <laughs> no. It could be that. It could be the the yogurt thing. Um, I thought it was uh, take care of business. We have to take care of business here, and it would help if you could just stay put and make sure nobody escapes that away. So, um, there we go. TCB. I don't. Yeah. Not. Not. Uh, an abbreviation that I think I've seen before, but um, yeah, makes sense. The country's best yogurt, TCBY. <laughs> okay. That's that's actually that that's that means the show's over. I sang a jingle, the episode's over. Okay. Thanks everyone. So uh, that's T TCBY is the yogurt, right, Tim? Uh, yeah, it's a it's a chain. I think it's still around. Uh, I think there was one. I don't know near where my brother went to school. Uh, TCBY, the country's best yogurt. Oh, that's uh, what it stands for. TCBY, frozen yogurt. <laughs> uh, I I do know that um, at at some upcoming GI Joe convention, hopefully this summer, uh, you know, if if traveling and being in shared public spaces uh, uh, feels safe and is not like canceled or delayed, and things are looking good. In addition to hopefully some Joe fans will sit down and destroy me in the new G.I. Joe deck building game. We can also go out for frozen yogurt as <laughs> a reference to issue 289. Very good. Um, so uh, what was next? Uh, it was Yo Joeage score. Uh, I'll, go, I'll go first because I think you're going to be higher than me. Okay. Um. So uh, I I respect that uh, Casey Maloney likes the inking job uh, that uh, Maria Keene did on this issue. I thought it was good. I I couldn't help but think based on uh, the cover and 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 the interior pages that the inking is good. But I I do wish that uh, Casey Maloney also inked this issue. Uh, schedules are what they are and editors got to get the books out. Uh, but as a general rule, uh, you are your own best inker. And uh, I like the art in this issue, uh, but, you know, looking at the cover, it's subtle, but I really would have loved to see uh, Casey Melody ink this. Um, and uh, though there's a lot to like about this issue, uh, that, that point that I made at the beginning when we sort of did our overview of the issue, um, it does feel... Uh, like a middle chapter mm -hmm. and um, considering that the blue ninjas are back and I do want them to come back. And I agree with you. I think they need to come back and I, I want to see a cool wrap up. And I do like that. We're checking back in with the casino on Cobra Island. What we do see of the blue ninjas here, it somewhat excited me. It didn't thrill me. So uh, I'm going to say five or six like a, a good issue of G.I. Joe. Mm -hmm. Okay, fair. 
Another reason why this issue loses half a point for me is that though there is a letters page, there aren't any letters. Yeah, and it's a bit of a shame. And if 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 Tom Waltz uh, or um, uh, editor Megan Brown, because they are short on time, because this is a hard book to put together, because uh, you know the license is. Um, expiring at the end of the year and what's more important is you know getting some cool cover artist for issue 298 and 299 right now than like calling some emails or maybe just no one sent any emails uh i know i sent an email but about the uh the saturday morning book but mm-hmm. um and uh waltz and brown are totally allowed to hype upcoming books in the letters page yet Right after letters page, there are several pages of ads. And I think that's the better place <laughs> to let G.I. Joe fans know that this cool 40th anniversary special is coming. And, oh, here's the cover. Um, I would I would much rather have uh, a letter or two because uh, that that's to me is part of the value of mm. the three ninety nine. You know, I get 20 pages of art and story and. Not not since the beginning, not since issue 155, but um, for much of the IDW run, I've also gotten a letters page. And, yeah. you know, fewer people are writing letters. It, it's sort of a different experience because it's not kids. Like mm. a lot of the letters in the 80s book were kids. It, it's, it's sort of more letters like a letter that I would write. You know, it's like, mm-hmm. I'm a fan. I've been reading this for a while. This was really neat. Thanks. It's like, yeah, um, sort of affirming. Um, but even if it's just one of those and Tom Waltz, it's like spending a paragraph, like saying how excited he is about the issue that you just read, it's like lethal Larry Hama and courageous Casey Maloney and um, <laughs> magnificent Maria Keen and uh, jolly Jay Brown. Right? <laughs> um, uh, I, I want letters. I want letters. Naughty Neil Utake. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think that's a really good point about the value proposition because you know the these books are collected as as trades and the trades are genuinely are generally lower cost per issue and also have lots of bonus features in the back like all of the variant covers and you only get you know often only get a single cover um on on the uh monthly books so you know why do you get the monthly books i guess it's to support the brand you get it you know much sooner than waiting for for trade but you also get something that doesn't get reprinted generally, which is the the letters page. So uh, having interesting content in the letters page is, I think, a key part of the value proposition for a monthly book as opposed to waiting for the trade. If I want to read a, a Hasbro licensed 80s property IDW toy based comic that doesn't have a letters page, I'll read Transformers. <laughs> okay, Specific. <laughs> um i'm probably not a million miles away from from that op- opinion really I, I think uh what most of what you're saying is definitely chiming i was yeah i was pleased that we're back in the regular story and it's getting propelled forward like you say it sort of did feel a bit more like the middle of a story which is probably slightly less exciting you know i've got i'm slightly divided on the the blue ninjas point um you know, I think it's it is an important part of the IDW storyline that that Larry has created, and and you know it really I guess as that wider piece does need to be resolved. But at the same time, it was a bit like eh, Blue Ninjas again. Mm. Um, you know, gen- generally it is the issues without the Blue Ninjas that that have been my preferred stories. Um, so um, you know, I can I can see it, but I have enjoyed issues. Uh, they're a little bit more grounded, a bit more gritty without without the Blue Ninja shenanigans in them. You know, I think uh, Casey's done a, a a good story, a good job with the with the art. the The storytelling is you know is super clear. That ne- never any room for for confusion as to to what's going on in terms of style. I probably do th- like things skewing slightly grittier, but but that's not to to dis- detract from uh, what he's done here. So I think for me, probably the the main thing that's just pulling this back a little bit is is just the the overall story just wasn't quite the type of story that uh, are my you know my very favourites. So 
probably the score would suffer for for that. So still enjoyable, you know. Love to see uh, the GI Joe book, regardless, and love to see the the overall story moving forward uh, after some some detours. So uh, I feel like Alan Sugar sort of about to fire someone here and ping ponging between things, but yeah, I think I'll land on about six and a half o- overall, which. Um, as Chief always says, uh, anything above a five is is never a regrettable read. Um, so yeah, did it did enjoy it, but just on the on the spectrum, I think uh, not not quite up there with uh, my favourite stories. Mm. What could also happen is if Don Marino, Helix, uh, Blue Ninja stuff, if more of this happens in a satisfying way in a future issue, this issue will look better in hindsight. Mm. Who is Alan Sugar? <laughs> so Alan Alan Sugar is the UK host of The Apprentice. Okay. Broadcast by the BBC since 2005, and it was devised after the success of the American original. So, okay, it's uh, the British. It, it doesn't always go this way. It's normally a British British program that spins off into American one, but uh, on this occasion, it, yeah, it was uh, the British adaptation of the american series but yeah running since 2005 so uh yeah that's uh 17 years i guess that's uh that it's been going with the uh same man at the the helm i, I don't know what you'd call the role but um <laughs> the businessman in his suit and tie uh alan sugar yeah anyway that's a bit of a that's a bit of an aside <laughs> But yeah, a very a, a big yeah a a big phenomenon for in terms of British TV. So one of the biggest uh, shows, I think, my, one of the most popular shows. So I think that is us done talking uh, the Dawn Helix Spotlight issue, and uh, next time on Talking Joe, we will be covering the very next issue to. 90, which is an October Guard spotlight issue. Looking forward to that one for sure. And uh, seeing if we can find out more about the mystery of uh, the return of the October Guard. We are also continuing to cover our look back at the disavowed era of G.I. Joe from Devil's Due. And specifically, we are covering the issues from Brandon Joa. So uh, tune into that for uh, our discussion of what G.I. Joe was looking like back in 2004. So, uh, Tim, where can people find you? My comic book store in Somerville, Massachusetts is Hub Comics and my blog for G.I. Joe thoughts and images is a realamericanbook.com. Excellent. And uh, do seek out uh, Tim's blog for his thoughts on G.I. Joe uh, Saturday Morning Ventures number one. Excellent uh, little bit of insight. Very, very well written and some uh, yeah little quality nuggets of uh, a real American Tim's lens. There we go. And you can find us on the usual places. Talkingjoe.co.uk is the website that has links to all of those places. So we've got a Facebook site uh, with discussions of various G.I. Joe shenanigans. Uh, We're on Twitter, Instagram, and also on Patreon. A big thanks to all of our backers, Richard, Sam, Jay, Bill, Christopher, and Justin, who are all getting early access to episodes, as well as some exclusive content so that's us done but remember nobody beats talking joe a real american podcast with a guy from england and around the world specifically over there in that place they call america laters Uh, have you have you listened to any episodes of Talking Joe thus far, Casey? Yeah, I was listening to a couple of them while uh, while I was drawing the comic. Actually, after you guys reached out, okay, what? Cool. Yeah, they're fun. <laughs> so nice. yeah, I started thinking about you guys as I was drawing. <laughs> after a while, I was like, hmm, what would, what you know, would Tim funny. and Mark I, like I, in this? Yeah, I was thinking Helix sort of looked like Mark, <laughs> on, on age sixteen and seventeen. That sort of perky quality, yeah.